welcome back. You are live with Expressa as we continue with our health discussion this morning. And it's time for the gents to learn a thing or two. We are talking about menstruating this morning. It is a biological function for women. And during that time of the month, women and girls experience both physical and emotional changes from mood swings, fatigue, even depression, to bloating, breast tenderness and headaches. But how does your period affect your diet and eating habits? And should you avoid exercise? during this time and this morning we went for answers we have an all-female panel and we've got all of the experts that will be sitting on our couch giving you the rundown now first we have dietitian Karina Adams who will be chatting about your diet and appetite during that time of the month which is so important and I'm intrigued to learn because I think we should normalize gathering information uh, completely I'm glad we've got women on that side of the discussion yes. and men on this side <laughs> and I think that's how it should be but um, and I'll say this over and over I'm the father to a girl child I am the, the partner to a woman. I need to know these things. And I think a big part of this is destigmatizing this whole conversation. Just get over yourself so that yeah. we can talk about it, so that we can ensure that young women especially are getting the advice and help that they need. So thank you so much. Um, you seem very excited that yes, it was two gents sitting you. down to, <laughs> to talk about this. Um, let's, let's start with what PMS or premenstrual syndrome actually is. So premenstrual syndrome is basically a group of symptoms. You know, the ones that you've mentioned that collectively put together and they've called them premenstrual syndrome. 47.8% of females actually experience this. So I, I like to explain it especially to men. Mm. Is it woman is a queen. Yeah. And with a queen comes a palace. And a palace has got many rooms but many servants. Yeah. When you lose five servants, what happens to the palace? <laughs> Chaos. Thrown yeah. into disarray. Yeah. So basically what happens to us, we've got hormones, estrogen and progesterone, that basically start to drop and fluctuate. So, hence, Chaos, hence the irritability, the bloating, the nausea, the vomiting, the cramps, the back pain. It, it is, it's so many emotions at once. So you can just imagine the chaos that we feel on the inside. Because it's physical and emotional. emotional. Yeah. And I mean, this chaos also needs to be understood prior to us saying, and you know, in, in pop culture, it's been like that. It's like, oh, she's on a period, don't yeah. worry yeah, about it. And, I, and I, I actually hate the fact that that has yeah. been the connection. You know, we have to have deep understanding. But you as a dietitian, you have some hacks around certain things just to alleviate some of those symptoms. One of them is bloating. Yeah. And I know bloating is the one that makes you feel very uncomfortable because I suppose if you've been working hard in the gym and suddenly the bloating happens, you're thinking, oh my word, what happened to my gains? <laughs> and I'm sure that there are some foods one can think about just to kind of minimize the bloating a bit and feel a bit better about yourself. So what I would suggest is you have to eat properly the whole month. You yeah. can't decide the week over period, okay, now I'm no, going to jump with the roll. system and yes. I'm going to eat better. So it starts by having whole foods. And what I mean is when I say farm to table, when it comes from the butchery to your kitchen, yes. when it comes straight fruits and veg fresh, to your table. Once it's been processed, it is not whole anymore. Okay. So you want whole foods. But when it comes to vegetables especially, there's some fruits that actually can worsen the bloating. Things like onions, right? And things like cabbage. But the bloating itself is not necessary to food. Food can contribute to worsening the symptoms. Okay. It's mostly linked to your hormones. But avoiding things like cruciferous foods, like cabbage and onions, and even broccoli, that can worsen the feeling of bloating. But there are also good things that you can eat to make things better. Things like vitamin D, which we get from the sun. Yeah. Yeah. And it's winter, so nobody really comes outside. <laughs> but in South Africa, our margarines are actually fortified with vitamin D. So having a slice of toast with margarine. And if you really are desperate, you can buy a supplement because vitamin D is actually linked to depression. It's, yeah. it's linked yeah, to anxiety. Yeah, we've discussed that so much throughout this COVID experience. Yes. How the, the vitamin D has become such a, an important measure. Uh, the symptoms aside, so we know that there are things that you can do to, to lessen or exacerbate the symptoms. Does your specific diet affect, can it affect your actual menstrual cycle, your flow? Definitely. So, especially the Olympics has just passed. Yeah. Yeah. No females were competing. So there's diets like severe low calorie diets, things like calorie restriction paired with intense exercise, they can actually inhibit your flow of your menstrual cycle. Because wow. your body still needs a necessary amount of protein, fats and carbs to have a proper menstrual cycle. Because your hormones are linked to protein, carbs and fats. And, and there's a lot going on. There's a yeah. lot already going on. And then also, 
and contrary, a diet excessive in amounts of carbs, excessive fats, excessive protein beyond what your body needs can also lead to having a difficult period, a very heavy period or heavy, heavier cycle or can also stop the flow of your menses. So either way, if you're not staying in balance, you cause a shift in the hormones. Like I said, there, there's, it's a com we are complicated beings as females. So if you shift one thing, you're bound to, to cause disruptions yeah. within this ecosystem. It's a system. I'm so glad you used that. That's striving to yeah. balance itself out completely. Well, uh, we're going to take it to you guys online now. Of course, we put it to you. If you had any uh, tips or comments, and it looks like a lot of you have weighed in. All right, let's take a peek very, very quickly. And uh, let's go for the first one. So now what we asked was, just to give you a little um, <laughs> context, we asked like, what are some of the, you know, sort of the, the craving snacks that you can't yeah. live without during your period. And the whole thing is to kind of, you'll see what's popping up. And I think this is gonna be a, a key conversation for you is because perhaps some of these are not too healthy. So maybe the <laughs> alternatives. So just that if you think about it, there was one here, uh, Ella Jones saying, uh, chocolate definitely chocked it. This has come through quite strongly as well. Yeah. Tebocha saying, uh, when I'm on my period, I crave for sweet things, uh, oras, squash uh, juice, mm -hmm. vanilla ice cream. Uh, Chantal's got chocolates there. Cindy Govan is saying hot water, TLC, and a back yeah. massage. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hey. Put it out there, man. Okay, just yeah, put why not? It out there. How about a foot <laughs> massage as well? Let's just put it all on the table. Why chocolate? Why sweet things? It's, it's basically, like I said, you've got these fluctuations of hormones. Yeah. So naturally you'll crave for something more sweet. To boost the mood, yeah. Just to boost the mood. But chocolate, like I said, the, also the last time, dark chocolate is yes. mood boosting. So that is okay if you're having one or two blocks. Okay. But when we're thinking refined sugars in terms of having foods that are completely high in sugar, donuts, like someone has mentioned, there was ice cream on there. You cause an imbalance with insulin levels. You it's want to gonna it's spike just going to spike. Even more. Yeah. Okay. You want this control. So when you've got the spiking, you can actually cause the body to become very fatigued. Yes. Right? Because it's insulin dropping and then insulin spiking. It's dropping and spiking and dropping and spiking when you want this balance of hormones flowing and sugars flowing. And that can also, this, this insulin spiking and dropping, spiking and dropping can actually add to weight gain. And uh, then you add with another problem because okay. now you're depressed because you've gained some weight because you haven't been eating properly. So you, you basically wow. what you're saying is you've just got to eat well all the time. All the time. Um, and then that's the bottom line. Um, I love that. Thank you so much. You've educated both of us. Thank you. Foot rubs, back massage. Yeah, Thank TLC you for those, those is actually quite important. We will do our utmost. Keep that conversation going on our social media pages. If you get a craving when it's that time of the month, what is it? And maybe you've got some tips, some hints on how you deal with that time. It's my feel good Show. This is Expresso on S3 and we need to continue our health segment conversation this morning. We are joined by biokinetics Ilona Falano. Mm, Ilona is returning to share her knowledge on how we can stay fit and active while menstruating. And I say we very <laughs> loosely. Obviously, uh, the gentleman this morning, we are doing uh, our part in destigmatizing this conversation. But I, maybe it's because I grew up in an all-female family. Um, I'm the father to a daughter. I'm the son to a mother. I'm the, the fiancé to a partner. We need to be able to talk about these things. I'd be doing my child, my daughter, a great disservice if I didn't normalize the conversation. So hence why Carl and I are trying our, our best to pick up as much as we can through this process. So um, I, I suppose the most important question from a physical perspective, how does your period affect your ability to train and exercise? Mm -hmm. Can you train while you know experiencing PMS and that's some of the more extreme, I suppose, side effects? Yeah, definitely. Well, it's great to have you guys <laughs> sitting in and comforting us during this time. But like Karina said, Said, with your bloating you obviously feel completely out of it you feel dizzy you feel lightheaded you feel fatigued you don't even want to get out of bed but it doesn't say that you cannot exercise or train at all I mean some some ladies may experience more extreme you know symptoms and it might affect um, how you train and the intensity at which you train but it doesn't stop you from training at all actually it will help alleviate some of those symptoms or depending on what you do you know like yeah. tapping into that lower back pain that hip pain so um, yeah. from a, a, an emotional stress we know how much we 
we alleviate with being able to exercise and just mm -hmm. get that out of your system as yeah. well. So, two-edged sword, yeah. So, the, the bloating is quite debilitating because yeah. what you feel is that you are not able to move. The mobility mm. feels like it's lacking. And I mean, obviously, obviously it starts up here. Because yeah. when you feel that way, you're thinking, I can't do this normal yeah. cardio, I can't do this normal thing. So, are there certain exercises that one should be thinking about if you are on your period? Or yeah. are there certain exercises that perhaps one should be avoiding? Yeah, so you could basically focus on balancing. That is very important because you'd feel obviously a bit disorientated, a bit dizzy. Yeah. And if you're yeah. doing turns, mm -hmm. if you're running, you feel a bit off balance completely. So balancing work is quite important during your period, right? Okay. Secondly, you'd keep it low intensity to medium. You don't want to be doing extreme workouts because then obviously it adds to your flow. You're, you're feeling more fatigued. And because of the loss of blood, you just want to rather just rest, keep it in. Uh, you know, light intensity, um, hydrating as well, which is very important, and then basically focusing on your stretches as well. Um, yeah, so I think you monitor. Some people have more extreme symptoms, which yeah. they'll rather rest your first three days, where others don't feel anything at all can continue. So it depends. Are you an athlete that requires physical, that your body's, you know, physically demanding for you to be active, and um, then your, your period will be affected as well. Whereas are you just day-to-day -day trying to get some exercise in, you'll be like, oh, I'm taking the first three days off, I'll rather pick up again, or we'll just take off the whole week. <laughs> Guilty, and yeah, that like so you said... your right, yeah. Yeah, right, it, yeah, it affects your gains, but like, because you feel glo bloated, and yes. you think, oh my word, I've been jumping so hard, and look now, like, it's all... But it's just for that, peri that period, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> excuse the pun. No, but it's, it's maybe that... You know, you, you you turn your attention to a different thing. I like the fact that you highlight stretching there. Mm. Yes. There's, there's ways that you can look at fortifying your body from mm. a different angle. It doesn't have to be that necessarily yeah. that high intensive. I'm just there to burn calories. Mm -hmm. What you, should you be avoiding? What exercises are a no-no? Anything high intensity. I think also a big contribution is comfortability. Okay. Just, you don't want to be doing side lunges and jumping all over the show and so if you keep your intensity low because you won't have enough energy to you know that high intensity keep it moderate so avoiding your your side to side movements keeping it more in a cardio um, based walking um, your step ups that you can do so you can do things that you yeah, will rather keep you safe um, or more comfortable and yeah it's just avoiding that things you know ladies uh, rather prefer not doing core. Yeah. Um, so it is. Which is understandable. Yeah, yeah. It, each individual will differ, but I think that side to side movements that, um, yeah, just something more extreme where you feel uncomfortable, rather keep it safe in like a linear. <laughs> For sure, no. <laughs> I get, get you to say, I'm just thinking of all of the. I'm going to apologize right now in advance to my daughter for all of the conversations we're going to have about this when I <laughs> step up thinking that I'm a, I, I know it all in this space. And that's why we <laughs> ask these questions. It's important because uh, I was mentioning earlier, we all should know about what our collective experience is. Completely. And some of us have of different condition. experiences, but we have to mm -hmm. ask these questions. Uh, with regard to stretching, which is something that I believe all of us should be doing, yeah. especially during your period, uh, are there certain things that could alleviate something that I, I hear a lot about, which is mm. the lower back pain mm. that is often connected to it. Are there some things, I know we're going to do a little bit of a demo soon, but yeah. just off the cuff, some of the stretches that we should be considering just to make it a bit more comfortable. Yeah, so one, one thing I'd like to do with exercise is you get blood rushing to that area. So yeah. because that area is paining, if you get blood rushing to that area, it heats up. So if you either use a warm bottle or you do a bit of dynamic exercises, blood goes to that area because the brain becomes aware. Yes. And then you do a stretcher. So you can do your cat and cow. You can do your figure four where you're laying on your back, and I, which I previously demonstrated. Yeah. And just stretching out that hip area as well so I think most of it will be demonstrated but if I can think off the top of my head your cat and cow stretches your child pose um, you'd basically want to do your straight leg bent over cr cross over yes straightly cross over you can do your um, child's pose your, your backward your downward dog you can do a figure four on the table so all of these I'll demonstrate but it's just finding Okay, what's more comfortable for you? Do you uh, because you feel bloated, you don't want to, you know, be yeah. bending and you know, adding more discomfort. So yeah. And ultimately, you know your body. You know your body yeah. exactly. better than anyone else. But I think it's that time that you need to demonstrate yeah. before everyone kind of gets their own <laughs> mental picture. Um, thank you so much. This has thank been you. really, really interesting. Got some great tips to carry forward. But I think let's let you go okay. and do that demonstration. Have fun. <laughs> Zoe is standing by. It's my feel good. So most <laughs> girls get their first period when they're around 12 years old, but getting it any time between the ages of 10 and 15 is very much within the normal scope as well. When it comes to younger girls, how can we as parents um, prepare them for their first period? And what is the correct way to explain puberty 
to children. Take a deep breath, dads. We've got to do it. <laughs> Kinder kineticist Amelia Adonis will be answering these burning questions for us. Um, does it make you feel more comfortable or less comfortable talking to two gents about this? Hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, that's uh, that's the question we're gonna, we're gonna ask you. I, oh, I think it's gonna have to happen. The big talk needs to happen. Thank, so it's for thank the boy you for saying or that. Grown up men exactly. and ladies or little girls. It has to happen. Yeah, man, it's probably one of the most natural parts of life. And it's an important thing. And, and actually, I was just telling Graham now about uh, I, I have an eleven-year-old who just came up to me and was like, what, oh, what's, going, "What's going on?" Mm -hmm. and yes, and he's like, "Hey, what's what's going on with this whole period thing?" Because he hears it at school, then he hears it at home, and he's wondering what's up. And I think what I loved about it is that I could sit him down, and he took genuine interest in it. Mm. And what I enjoy about that is that, let's just say in class, if one of his classmates, you know, has a period, at least he knows exactly how to respond. him. And in fact, he could probably assist calling a teacher saying, I know what's going on here, let's be discreet and, and help somebody. Yeah. Yes. It just shows you the community that we're trying to build with information. Mm. How do I broach that with my daughter then when she is coming close to that time and we've got to have a natural conversation about it. What is the best way, do you think, to explain menstruation to a young girl? And we know that this can be as early as... 10, 11 years old. Yeah. So I'd say start it early. Um, so don't wait until, okay, now she's now 10 years old. She's starting to develop breasts and everything that's happening along with it. Um, sit down. Start taking it from the age of 6 to 7 because obviously they understand the basics. So obviously they're going to see mommy in the bathroom. Mommy is now changing her sanitary pad. Um, mommy, what is that? Use that opportunity because use um, natural um, times to explain what it is. Yes. Break it down and ask your child, so what do you know about um, menstruation? What do you know about a cycle? Um, so that you can know, okay, so my child is on this level, so now obviously I can go to YouTube and Google, okay, how do I explain <laughs> to my child on this level? Because <laughs> YouTube is perfect, there's books that you can read. Um, and Which obviously parents ask, have gone through it. Exactly, yeah. and a lot. And ask your, your peers, ask other parents, how did you explain it to your daughter? Um, and obviously just sit them down and have the talk. Don't go, okay, like I said, she's now 10 years old, now I need to have the talk. Oh, it's there. To gradually yeah. go yeah. into it. And I suppose by having those conversations regularly, yes. you create a tone yes. so that they can and you can go to each other and talk about anything ultimately. Because exactly. you don't want the pressure of saying, okay, it's going to happen soon, eh? Let's yeah. get you ready, eh? <laughs> it's like, I think that could be quite intimidating. Yes. So, how, how, isn't there a sort of subtle way we can introduce, let's just say, the contingency plan, the DIY? period preparedness pack that we can have on standby that we could equip somebody with and what should something like this include? Okay, so I say, remember, it's already nerve-wracking for the child when she now already gets it. Now it actually yeah. happens at school and there's nothing. Now I have to go to the principal or I to the secretary, can I please have a sanitary pad? No. You as a parent or whoever, if you add uh, means to it, obviously, yes. um, get yourself a little DIY pack. So I usually pack myself into like the packets, um, like a little purse. Um, and in the purse, you obviously put your sanitary pad or your tampon, yeah. you put a panty liner, um, some paint tablets you can put in there. And then also like a little feel good, like a chocolate, if they obviously do get the periods. And you know, we crave chocolate. Uh -huh. um, so you can put your chocolate in there. So then you have the little pack in their bags. Um, and it's obviously the boys can't see what it is. So when they quickly run to the bathroom, you can put it in your pocket. Then you have it in your bag. So you can have it yeah, wipe back. Pet. It's also a cool little conversation starter. Yeah, yeah exactly. To, to be able to broach the subject <laughs> yes. with, your, with your little one. It's one thing, because there is such a complex emotional transition happening at that time. Yeah. How do you give your daughter the tools to be able to handle that mental shift, do you think? Like I said, break it down and start the earlier the easier, I say. Um, so obviously sit them down and tell them, okay, this is going to happen to you and explain broadly what is going to happen. And also tell them, but remember, it's not only you. Yeah. yeah. All girls are going to Every single and also woman remember that on the planet. Exactly. Yeah. And you are unique because you're experiencing different pains. Like I will have back pain and my friend will have intense stomach pains and her back will be very sore and low and um, her lower back will be paining, yeah. etc. So each one is different. And also, parents, please do not go when the child is now saying, Mommy, I have my period for the first time. Say, Oh, my word, my daughter is young, my sister, and tells the whole family. Yeah. Ask the child, can I, can I share this? Yeah, that's can I share this? It's embarrassing already for some children yeah. to now say, Okay, I'm on my period now, and that kind of stuff. So please ask. Because mentally, that breaks them down in a sense, because now everybody knows and it's a big celebration. I don't want it to be a don't celebration. Don't be that, parent. That is, that's such a, cult, it's a cultural thing, isn't it? it? Is. You know, and you need to kind of nip it in the bud and also ask the individual. Otherwise, it feels like, oh my word, my business is out there. Exactly. And I just wanted to take some time to find out exactly what's going on. Uh, so for, I know that you get options, tampons or pads. Mm. Now for the first period, what do you think is the best? Especially gauging that conversation as well with you know, your daughter, 
What would be the best practice in that space? Um, so obviously each child is different, so it depends on the child as well, and it depends on you as the parent as yeah. to what you are educating your child and what to use. Um, so whether it's a pad, whether it's a tampon, I can't say which one is the best because it depends on the child. And each yes. child, like I said, is different. And each child is de developmentally, they are different. So if I'm going to try to use a pad and you're actually comfortable with a tampon, it's up to you as a parent as it well. But obviously also, sure. um, also prepping them for how they need to use the sanitary pad, how to use the tampon, so they don't go into this thing blindly using a tampon and then obviously don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and also breaking the myth saying that if you use a tampon, this is going to happen to you, or you've really rushed your virginity, etc., etc. and yeah, if you yeah. use a pad. Also telling them how to dispose of it properly and how to insert into their panties, etc., etc. So obviously educating them and empowering them to use these things properly. M power with education. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much. Um, we didn't get to touch on how boys can be desensitized, but I think the same standard yeah. applies. Start talking to them, start talking to them early um, and create that mode so that you can talk to each other so that you, you don't have those moments of discomfort and shock and fear that should not be associated to this in any way. And ultimately, dads, you've got to get over yourselves and have that <laughs> conversation.